Uh, someone over here had their hand up for a while. Was that you? Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but going back to Russian TV, it's really interesting. I mean, the only news television I watch is Russian and Al Jazeera. I, RT? Uh, yeah. Okay. Because the sort of things that they they're free to talk about. I mean, it's just ludicrous to think that that could have ever been. If you watch it, you just think that will never ever be on British television. And I think the reason, it, like the, the, the amazing like uh, stories that they run, is because, I mean, it's because they don't threaten the elites of their country. So is Russia T RT TV a great station? No, it's terrible. Because like, if you go to Russian stuff, it is the worst quality journalism ever. But that's because they can't report on, you know, how Vladimir Putin's, you know, destroying, you know, Chechnya or how he's, you know, brutally suppressing other political parties. So, I mean, you can see the BBC are free to criticise Putin and, you know, basically report the facts because it doesn't threaten their own, um, you know, masters of mankind in their country. Whereas it's the same with Russian television. They feel completely free to tell the truth about the US banking system and you know the eurozone crisis and what have you and it's because that their funders uh, are fine with that because it doesn't threaten them the 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 you're exactly right RT and Al Jazeera have exactly the I mean I watch them too for that reason I, I check in to see a different perspective there are still though structural elements to them that prevent them from doing great journalism on the whole, and that is that they are still advertising dependent, and they are still owned. I don't know about our TV. Um, it, well, their ownership structures are traditional, yeah. and that's safe to assume. And what you see is that not only does that create leanings, so that they can't, you know, certain things are off limits in their own country, but they're sort of encouraged to go after the the Western dominant uh, narrative and story and viewpoint. Um, but they still have the structural model of their newsrooms that are profoundly um, incapable of producing thoroughly good journalism on a wide stream basis. Not that they can't do a good story, they can do a great story, um, especially in cases where some of their journalists are just intrepid as hell and they go out, they get a good story, they get good sourcing, they do the work. But they still actually have an institutional discouragement, a disincentive to do good journalism, which is it's expensive, it's costly, and it's not that competitive. Um, the, the competitive stuff is to do the fluff journalism that gets people to buy the newspaper and, and watch the channel. So there's still those limitations, even though, just as you acknowledge, I mean, they, they put out some really good stories that you're really not going to hear yeah. in the West until they've exposed them so much that the UK, American, whatever press has to actually start covering it. Well, it's very interesting, even as I was saying, you know, I'll just hear it's brilliant, but there was a report that came out a couple of weeks ago that still like a sort of like trying to be as objective as possible and it came out that yeah, Al Jazeera has a very pro American bias. And that's not what I don't think many Americans who've watched it. But when you go to the Middle East, Al Jazeera yeah, is the Western propaganda piece yeah, according I mean, to them. It's all perspective, man. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up question to that? Um, Please yeah. Because I, I learned recently that, that there are some big uh, structural changes within uh, the ownership of Al Jazeera and that the managing director was forced out, I think it was about two weeks ago. Al Jazeera, the main one, or English? No, the one based in Qatar. Okay. And I just wonder if you have any perspective. I'm sorry, I, I can't speak to that authoritatively. I can shed some on that. Um, there's, I mean, there's no change in ownership because they're still owned by the royal family of Qatar and uh, they're meant to be independent. And, uh, and the person, I mean, the managing director that you're referring to, uh, has gone to some lengths to you know to, to kind of keep the uh, to keep the independence of Al Jazeera. Uh, rumors are that they were obviously uh, that the government of Qatar was not really happy with the coverage of of the Arab Spring. So um, I mean, so basically, rumors have it that uh, Al Jazeera is gonna you know it, they're going to bring in somebody which is going to have a uh, more hands-on role, um, if you like, a bit like uh, the Murdoch editors. Um, so yeah, that's to answer. Uh, second point, though, I mean, to, to bring like all the threads of the conversation together, because you're talking about about tests and you're talking about Russian TV. I have a friend that works for, uh, that, I mean, that, that, that does programs for Press TV, which is the Iranian TV, and he has done a couple of uh, really brilliant programs about um, about lobby groups 
especially in the uh, arms industry. And I mean, stuff which you'd never be able to see on the BBC or any of the other UK channels. And it's rather funny that they're actually, uh, you know, they're actually on, on the Iranian TV, which otherwise is frankly shit. I mean, it's homophobic, it's Zionist, it's, sorry, it's, it's, it's sort of anti-Semitic, and so on and so forth, but yeah, like, you, you do get these sort of, like, uh, rare gems, if you want to call it that way, because obviously they, you know, they, they are they are interested in pumping particular propaganda and so on and so forth. Um, I just want to, like, sort of take one small point that the lady said when she said about the Metro, about the Metro not having too much political coverage. Well, the Metro is supposed to be, um, you know, an, an appetizer, if you like. The Metro is supposed to be something... Is it a free newspaper? Yes. yes. Okay. So the Metro is supposed to be something that, that whets your appetite, if you like. Uh, you just glance at it uh, when you go to work, uh, and then you buy the paper. I mean, and, and, and also, if you look... You buy? Which paper do you buy? Oh, I, I, I personally, I read all no, papers sorry. online. No, sorry. You're supposed to... You say you glance at the Metro, and then you're supposed to buy one. Yeah. yeah. The no. big difference I've noticed, traveling on the tube over the last 10 years, is that I could never pick up a decent newspaper by the time I get to Hobart. It's because everybody's reading free newspapers oh, and leaving. I always no read it online. I, I just don't read. Uh, so I don't, I don't think people bought to get read anything else. Just I think they read something by yeah. on the tube. Oh, I mean, I mean, like why people buy the Sun? I don't understand it. But it's still like the biggest, the largest selling newspaper in, in the country. It's just like a fact of life. I don't like it, but yeah. you know, I, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so the thing is, uh, yes, you know, the metro is owned by by, by the daily, uh, you know, by, by daily mail trust. So there's this particular point which we have not touched so far, which is the free newspapers, because it's very interesting to see at the Evening Standard. Mm -hmm. The Evening Standard was about to go bankrupt. They're making 15 million pounds a year loss. Uh, they were taken on by the Russian oligarch. Um, I think that they are expected to, um, you know, to, to, to actually like, uh, I mean, to, to stop losing money, and by next year they're supposed to, to, you know. To uh, they turn be it making into a free money. Pardon? Yes, it, yeah, is, okay. it is actually it is a quality, but it's a free newspaper. And funnily enough, they have not compromised on their journalism, whatever, whatever views. And I don't pretty much like their journalism. Um, so my point being, though, that I mean, and they have they have trebled their 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 circulation. My point being is that uh, there are so many media outlets, and and it's just to apply the five tests, and 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 to somehow have this sort of like conscientious understanding of. Uh, of, of like where the balance lies is whether it's left or right. I think I think that's a false choice. I think that actually, uh, even with the best will in the world, uh, many times journalists um, are unable to print the full facts of the, of the story uh, for whatever reason, for lack of space, for for an agenda, for and so on and so forth. So the question that I have now is, uh, given that there are so many, uh, you know, given the media landscape is so fractured, there are so many different competing interests, like as we saw with Murdoch, for example, all the other media organizations ganged up on Murdoch because obviously like, you know, he's trying to strangle them. Um, is there a, a, and I'm using the word for, for want of a better word, is, is there something like a superstructure, albeit like uh, maybe an unconscious superstructure, but, but do you think that there is something like a superstructure which perpetuate, which perpetuates this, this sort of very loose coalition of, of the media, and I'm saying very loose coalition from like, you know, from, from Daily Express, which is very right wing, to, you know, to The Guardian, which is sort of like left wing, some people would say. Um, do, do you think basically that, I mean, do you think that basically there is something like, you know, I pat your back now and, and yeah, yeah is, is there like an unspoken agreement? Not necessarily a conspiracy theory uh, kind of thing, but is there such a thing? And, and if there is, how could the five, um, I mean, how could the five filters be applied to it? Uh, do you want to speak for, to that for this society? Because I. Mm. Just say the the root of the question again. Um. Is there, an Is there a rule between the right. newspapers, for example, yeah. in the way that they purport to sell their well, okay, so and their political views that are associated yeah. with them? Is there some sort of invisible? You know, cartel actually working at work when in fact all the, you know, the, the heads of these papers are actually got some dark, you know, sort of agreement. Look, we'll sell five hundred thousand if you only stick to three hundred thousand. You know, is there or, or less like explicit. Or, or yeah. Like yeah, I don't think it's explicit in that way, but it will be around things like um, we do have a democratic government. I, 
Literal sense or loose? But it's an ideological. I mean, in a loose sense, yeah. So I mean, there will be the assumption that we are a democracy, and that will be shared. So we give the impression there's a different sets of papers with different political views. Yeah. But in essence, there's a very yeah. narrow. Yeah. I I I've I've all I've identified an additional filter that I think is is also crucial, which is the J school filter. Uh, in the U.S., only about half of journalists actually, professional journalists actually attended a, a journalism school for an undergraduate degree. Um, it's not a profession, it's still a trade, but there is a, there, there are several journalistic organizations that influence the journalism schools, and it is sort of a culture and almost a, a, a religion around how news is produced and really what you're allowed to say in the news. That's how these filters are actually conveyed in large part. And that when we say a journalist, we're, we're talking about reporters and editors, the people who are making the decisions on the details of the articles, that they're going to reflect these filters. And they don't sit around in a meeting and run through the filters to determine what goes in a story or whether a story gets published. I mean, you're never going to find a newsroom. They might bring up something. They might say, are we going to get flack for that? It's conceivable. But they don't run each story through those filters. The filters are in how they behave. And a lot of this is brought in through journalism school that creates, and, and then in the culture of the newsroom. So what it does is creates an understanding of what you can and can't say. Um, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give a couple of brief examples of some stuff that, that, I, that I think can help convey some of this really quickly. Um, when I first got to see BBC World in the US when I got satellite television, started watching uh, Newsnight, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I was super thrilled about Newsnight, just because once a week there was someone who was bringing fairly elite sources and confronting them and kind of not letting them get away without answering. And this to us in the United States is unheard of. We simply don't see this. If a, if a, if, if a politician or you know, someone in a position of authority, an elite, doesn't want to answer a question, you might ask it twice, but you don't ask it three times and you certainly don't halt the interview to make them answer it. So that that happens here was mind-boggling to us um, and kind of exciting. And I watched Newsnight week after week after week after week for you know a, the better part of a year probably, I'd say. Um, but I never saw on Newsnight, um, including I think a piece that they produced as a documentary about the financial collapse, any challenge of the system whatsoever. Ever, ever, ever. And I can't say I saw every single episode, but I certainly saw enough to know that it was not a significant part of Newsnight's approach to the media, or to, to, to journalism. Um, and I, I believe recently, I'm sure half of you have seen this clip that was, it hit the internet like a week ago. I think it was BBC or some British channel was interviewing someone from Wall Street. That's right, Russ Army. that was on BBC News when effectively he admitted that effectively the whole world is run by Goldman Sachs. Right. And of course, you flabbergasted and, uh, right. No, no, right. Tell us, explain for people who haven't seen this, what a, a Wall Street trader, Wall Street or the... Yeah, he was from London. Okay, London. Yeah. 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 What was yeah. happening with the global downturn or the global crisis and where the sources may lay. And effectively, um, of course they were talking about, yes, it's about Ben Bernanke and head of the Federal Reserve and the fact that, you know, they're burning out money and what is it is easy. But he came straight to the point, he said, it's got nothing to do with any of that at all. Goldman Sachs basically runs the whole financial market system in Wall Street. They dominate. He, he said he runs the world. They run the world. Yeah. Well, they do. Well, apparently, you know, they have. Um, I think figures came out. They earn or have in their coffers seventy-three trillion dollars, which is more than the. Right, but the, the details don't matter. He, th this is a. This is a. He's a trader who's he's saying. A former, former trader within Wall Street. Yes, he's okay. Out, and he's basically said the sorts of things that people have known for some time in the financial market. Goldman right. Sachs have been running the show, you know. But the interesting thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, he was just completely explicit about how they operate. The interesting thing isn't what he says. No one in this room would have been particularly surprised by what he said. First of all, it was interesting that he had candor, but what was the most interesting thing about it was the response of the hosts of the show. They were upset. They were, they, they were upset that the, one of the greatest pieces of scoop, kind of, that has been on the, in, in, the, in the world media in years happens on their show, and the response isn't awesome. I mean, first of all, the, re the response of, of every viewer at that point must be, how come no one has asked these guys this? Right, yeah. right? But they went, will never ask it. It then went on to ITV. If you go on the internet, itv.com, 
And of course, following his BBC uh, interview, he then went further and he said, look guys, this is what's happening. Goldman Sachs are running the world. You need to do something about it. Because if you don't, you deserve everything you get. All the other panelists just looked down and couldn't. Yeah. They couldn't say because he's absolutely right. We right. Need to but, the, but, the, but the point, the point is that journalists the don't want, they, they don't even know what to do. It makes them look awful for never having asked, right. even though it's the question. Um, and, and not only haven't they asked it, they've never even implied that it's possible to ask it. They've never implied that it's something we should think about. We we'll try to. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yes. And the comments from people, they're like they're in two camps. They're very in two camps. The first camp said, "Well, yeah, I mean, how can they get away with it?" And the other camp were really could not. I mean, they they seriously doubt this. No, no, this guy is just winding us up. He cannot be serious. This is just a big, big, big joke. And they right. actually but maintained this for sort of about for a day until until issued the first day and said, no, no, it's not a joke, actually. I was being serious for sort of, for about a day. They could not decide if he was actually being serious or if he was just like winding people up on television, uh, you know, playing like the bad banker. So I, I think that's most telling about this whole thing is that actually people thought it was a joke. I'd be really careful about the comments as well. And that's one thing that we haven't touched on actually is the comments like, um, below the line on websites. Is it like, if you read on the Guardian website, there's, they're not Guardian readers like, posting those comments. So, do you know what I mean? It's like, who's got time to hang out on the Guardian website and post all these, like, really? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how we can incorporate comments on websites into this. Yeah. this no, no, like, should be good. Okay. Filter. Chomsky did talk about how that can come in the Slack filter in terms of sometimes it's lobby groups that are quite well organised and they, they do in Right. Well, when we when we talk about flack, we're definitely talking about reader response to some extent. But especially if interest groups uh, organize reader response, and the more influential the reader. So if you get an email from a lord versus you know just someone who's a, who just happened to pick up the copy of the newspaper that day, which one's going to have more influence? Which ones should? They should just be opinions. I mean, really, that's how I would treat it as a journalist. I look at different opinions. I evaluate maybe their interests. So if someone is a lord, I would know maybe a little bit about them. Um, but generally, I'd want to evaluate the actual opinions, but that isn't what happens. It's not the content of the opinion that influences the news. It's the weight of the opinion offerer. Um, but it, and I don't know how much, I honestly have no idea how much attention they pay to the comments on their websites. I, I, I assume it's actually fairly little because they're, they're, they're aware of these things too. So the, important, the comments on the website are influence us. I don't know how much they are to influence the, the outlet itself. Um, I want to stop for a second. I know a few more of you have questions, but I wanted to, do you want to? No, no, I'll just, okay. I'll just notice. We have, we, what, what I wanted to do um, for, an, for another minute was that we had on the, on, the, on the agenda here was to sort of present some um, critique, not even critique of this model, but I, I want to present one alternative idea that is very dominant in the United States, and I, I believe it's fairly dominant here too. Um, the propaganda model is very thorough. It got, starts in this big book called Manufacturing Consent, where it was heavily documented. Um, and then there's this other idea, and, and it doesn't say there's a rightward lean to the media. It's not that simple. What it says is it, 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 you apply these filters and you get what you get. You get pro-corporate. I mean, you want to call that right wing, whatever. You can call it, you know, there's, there's liberal pro-corporate and there's right wing pro-corporate. Um, but the, but in, in the end, it's going to be pro-corporation, pro-commercialism, um, you know, and it's going to feed into these filters. So. In the, in the US, there's a very pervasive idea, and this is actually a fact, that when you do a study of journalists, they're an opinion study, and you evaluate what their views are of the world, um, they tend to come out on the liberal. About 70% of them come out on what's quote unquote liberal. Now, they're not radical, they're not even really particularly progressive, but they do squarely fit into this whole you know, social liberal, um, you know, uh, uh, not the classic liberal economic sense, but sort of um, what I think a lot, in, at least in American speak, it's you know the liberal idea of uh, regulation of free enterprise. So that you know we don't want a free market; we want a market that's controlled. But they're not anti-market. Um, you know, there's no no radical opinions. But because they come out as quote unquote liberal, the idea, the real, the only real opposing model to the to, to this that I that I've ever seen is just this quote unquote model 
that because journalists are liberal, that's why the media lean to the left. Um, now, there's numerous empirical studies that suggest, based on source studies and you know content of the stories, or the choice of stories that they produce, that the media don't lean to the left. But let's say they do. Um, let's yeah. say even looking at newspapers that do, like the Guardian or whatever. Um, what 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 is the what is the effect that the reporter's opinion on a story can have? And, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm accepting that at least on social issues, like say in the U.S., I mean, there's a huge contention on abortion. Journalists are overwhelmingly pro-choice in the U.S. So there's one example where um, how much can that opinion have versus the weight of all these filters? This is corporate structural ass assessment of what pressures journalists to do certain things versus their opinion. Which one do you think is going to win out in the end? And it's clear that their, the, their boss is going to win in the end. Um, but I'm wondering if folks have run into this argument a lot, if that's pervasive here, or if I shouldn't go too far into it, or, or talk about how to I examine think it's that. Pervasive for the BBC. You know. For the BBC, I think it, that argument's really pervasive. But oh, lefty journalists, you know, you'd be out on the yeah. street speaking up for this. Like, oh, sorry. I was just saying that I think it is really common here in terms of the um, attitude about the BBC. People think that that it's full of left-wing journalists and therefore it's left-leaning. That's my impression, anyway. It falls into the filter, doesn't it? It's, yeah, yeah, they are left-leaning. In business, in, in the pro-corporate narrow strip, they're the left-hand side of that very narrow strip. So, yeah, they are. Yeah. So, it, so it turns out, in economic reporting, it turns out that there is a lean toward a sort of Keynesian uh, Presentation. It's not radical. It's not even. It's just a. It's an acceptable version, really, of Keynesianism as what it is. Is this idea that yes, the government should intervene in the economy in this and this way, um, which basically means you know largely handouts to commercial organizations, to to private organizations or whatever. But I mean that's clearly within the acceptable. I mean no, you know the corporations are okay with that. Or, or you know we should be careful where we bond. Yeah, you know, that's right. Right. No, 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 or, or again, yeah, how to go about the war versus yeah. whether we should go about the war. That's what we're talking earlier on about. Oh, there's a left-wing papers and what? Yeah, Biden and independent. We're all like, well, we really should be careful about how we yeah. engage in this war. Right, and yeah. you need to do it in a principled way. And we don't want to be lied to about it. We want to go in with full knowledge that we're doing this. You know, what we're doing, which is, yeah, better, but not. Yeah, we, yeah, we so want full knowledge of the range of options. We want full knowledge of of what the potential outcome might be of it. The BBC lends itself to that kind of criticism as well because it's public funded. So, you know, of course you're going to get that kind of accusation. But why do you say that? Because it's, I mean, because if it's publicly funded but through the government and therefore what, how does a government lens make it well, I mean, like progressive? mean, libertarian or right-wing kind of... Uh, okay, so it's pro-government. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. Kind of perspective BBC just BBC. on that basis. They think it's left-wing. Fair enough. Okay, I understand. Um, so, so are there, before we do, I'll, we'll open up to general questions again, and we don't have a tremendous amount, we have uh, 20 more minutes? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just want to ask if there are other competing models that people are familiar with that they, or that they've encountered people arguing for? Did Michael Peretti write a book about this? Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting... Uh, I haven't read it, sorry. Michael Parenti crit criticized some of these ideas. Um, and the, mostly what he was after wasn't the media stuff in particular, but he did have some views on the media issue. Michael Perenni is another uh, American writer who had, not anymore, but he, at, at, at 20 years ago, he had close to the prominence of, of a Noam Chomsky type figure. And he started kind of an intellectual war with Noam. Um, it, it was largely over this idea of Noam Chomsky saying, this isn't conspiracy theories, these things are understood. And I went to see Michael Parenti talk one time, and he said something that I thought was actually really astute, which I think, I, I think that there's a bridge between what the two of them were saying. Parenti was presenting this idea that there really are conspiracies in the media. Um, and he said, he's often asked, you know, so what are you saying that, uh, you know, there's people that sit around a boardroom table, some round table, and they sit around and they conspire to deliver, you know, what version of the truth they're going to give us this day. And his response was hilarious. I'll never forget, I love it. He said, he would say, no, I think that they do it while jumping out of an airplane. Of course they do it around a round table. Where Chomsky would always say, there's no round table, there's no smoke-filled room. Um, there literally is this in the newsroom, and there literally is this in the boardroom. So 
there is a conspiracy in the sense that these folks are getting together and deciding what to prioritize, how many pages of hard news versus how many pages of entertainment news and all of this kind of stuff. But, but that's, that's, not the, that's not a conspiracy, that's just known. I mean, I think it's what Noam was referring to earlier. These aren't secret things. Like, it's understood that if they didn't do that, they'd be criminal in terms of they're supposed to just seek profit. That's their job. So it's, when he, when he says there's no conspiracy, what he kind of means is this overarching thing that there is, and that's his answer to that idea of is there this overarching ideology, um, you know, or even a nudge-nudge type thing. And it isn't explicit. But um, I think that Parenti, I, you know, I can't represent him even as well as I can represent Noam, but his idea would be, you know, that there is more of this that goes on. And that's, that's I don't think Parenti disagreed with any of, the, of the, the, the main propaganda model. I think he was just saying that it's a little more conspiratorial. It's, it's a little still less, fits, doesn't it? It they're still selling, fits. They're yeah. selling an audience mm -hmm. to advertisers. They have to make sure that whatever their editorial line is or whatever news they choose fits the audience, so they keep hold of that audience, so they can keep selling it. Yeah. So they have to make some conscious. It can, a lot of it can be unconscious, but they have to make some conscious decisions on: Are we going to lose readers on this, yes. or are we going to lose the right type of readers or gain the right type of readers? So I'm okay, yeah, let's. Yeah. yeah he, Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Both both of you are going to get your questions. Don't worry. Go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. At the moment, there is this uh, the hacking scandal is being uh, there's an inquiry. I lost my piece of paper with the guy's name. And he also came out, a Pickyard, I think, from the Daily Star, that, yeah, which hasn't been mentioned yet either, uh, came out and said that they are giving stories or an ideological line or an agenda, and that they're told, this is, this is at the inquiry that's going on at the moment about illegal practices in journalism, namely hacking into voicemails and so on. Did you hear about this? I'm going to let Allison take this one. No, so he, he certainly blew the whistle or said there's hardly any truth in the news and that everybody is doing that. In fact, even when they do have news, you get things like everybody's witness statement. Well, I'm standing on this corner and I heard this uh, blast or whatever noise and I saw four cars, which of course isn't really news. It's not where, um, I don't know what people are, um, so pure I was to be interested in where every witness was standing, but I would like to know more about the incident, you know, why the riot, and so on. But all you get is everybody's personal view, that's what and it's hardly news, news, I feel. But yeah, it's a motive, it's and I think that's what they're trying to do. It's a motive, oh. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Get you engaged, but well, perhaps so deflecting where there's real truth and the source of the issue is. Yeah, and there are attempts to try and say that this is down to one rogue organization that it's not systemic that it is about a particular organization so there's that emphasis and then you've also got um, the argument that that this scandal came out is because we have freedom of the press I mean that's what this um, the head the headline here in in yesterday's Guardian is saying but if you were applying the propaganda model to this, the idea that this event got exposed is an example of freedom of the press misses the point that it took so long for anyone to say it was a problem. They were just Isn't this like a government <laughs> covering up things for 30, 40 yeah. years? So mm -hmm. by that time, the people that were you know, to blame the culprits have already long gone yeah. and passed off. I mean, yeah. Isn't that the same sort yeah. of thing? I'm just going to ask about he, he was Sorry, yes. for a while. Um, I was going to kind of look at it from a slightly different point of view. I mean, I, I readily accept the model and apply it in my day-to-day -day life, as I'm sure a lot of us do. So we're all very discerning when we look at news and um, we're careful as to what we consume, which is also why a lot of us are here, because we produce our own media. Um, so I'm from Ceasefire and our, like, model is that it's completely non-funded, non, no advertising, nothing. And the reason is exactly this. However, obviously that limits our base, that limits our, um, you know, outreach and everything. So my real kind of point here, or question at least, is without using capitalist models as such, you know, to, um, to kind of 
to fund our media outlets, how exactly do we make them truly successful? I know that's not something you're going to have that I can necessarily answer for, but it's kind of the question I'm sure a lot of us are kind of asking. That is exactly the topic of the discussion I'm giving with Jessica Azuli tomorrow in the second slot. The, the, uh, the new standard, the organization that I worked with, had a counter model to this um, that was extremely successful in a lot of ways um, and that we learned really important lessons from. And we can, we're going to talk in great detail not just about um, funding and all that kind of stuff um, and how to remain independent. Um, but workplace structure, all sorts of alternative methods for producing news. But I don't, I don't think it's quite within the, unless you want to comment on it, I don't want to say so it. What's on your staff tomorrow? Uh, whatever the second session is. Second session. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to, I, I, I want to respond, but it would be, no, no, I mean, I'll even talk to you about it afterwards yeah. if you want to have great, I, and I'd love to hear more about your project. Um, sure. But that's going to be the whole focus of what we do. And I think there's a couple other workshops kind of that apply also that might be going on tomorrow. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just um, wondered if either of you could say a few words more about what, what are the, the main corrupting factors for a public institution at BBC. I think I understand broadly from <coughs> what you've already said about the model. I'd just like you to expand a little bit on what, what, are, what are the main factors corrupting a public institution like the BBC. Well, that it is, uh, you know, it will, um, there's a kind of consensus on how, you know, what's important in the news, that we don't knock the system of government, we might question the government that's sitting at that particular time, um, that the distribution of resources in on the earth is kind of, Act like that accidentally rather than because the way in which foreign policy works, those kinds of things. What, what so, pre pressuring that, that outlook, that, that message? Well, I think that, um, I mean, it's partly what you, you were saying about journalism school and the idea that it's very hard to be, ta as, as a journalist working their way up the system, to be carrying views that are kind of counter to the the dominant perspective um, and the BBC still like other organizations will want to be part of the lobby system and so their sources are going to be you know more elites and so on with their views and their perspectives and their their version of events and there's just it's just the idea that you know once you get into the elite group you see things from the elite's perspective and it's very hard to accept that in serving your own interests it's actually having an effect on people who whose interests the system isn't serving so it's the idea that you you come to have interests in the status quo in the system remaining the same so it's both ideological and also to do with filters like sourcing. I, I would say, I would agree that I think the sourcing filter is the one that is most pervasive. Um, I think it's the one that is explicit in the newsroom. You will hear stories about editors saying, well, we can't really burn that source, so let's not ask that question, let's not print this, let's not contradict this, let's not point out that this person is an absolute idiot and has been wrong about everything that we've ever asked them for 20 years. So when you look at economists in the US media, the economists that, um, that ensured us that there wasn't a housing bubble in the early and, and mid 2000s were literally two of one the same guys, and I do mean guys, who were saying during the tech bubble that there wasn't a tech bubble. It just, it, I mean, they just went, the, the media, they were, they were really good on TV and they reinforced what the establishment wanted everyone to believe. And the owners of the media are the same people that are the owners that are on Wall Street, who are who are ahead of the game, and the investors who want to keep this this thing flowing. Nobody had any problem with this, and then one bubble bursts, the tech bubble in '99, and so it's kind of like, well, why? You know, what we need to not do is ask the same people this. We did. They asked the same exact people in 2004, 2005. Wait a minute. You know, like you know, the question to ask is, can this really go on forever? Isn't your model 
of this economy that housing prices will continue to rise indefinitely. And if they don't, won't what 5% what of you are saying will happen, happen? Now, I don't, we haven't talked to the 5%, so that's one reason we're not going to ask this question, because then we'd be highlighting that we haven't listened to those people. But you know, if, if, if they were to ask that question, it would have exposed a fundamental flaw in the logic. So you don't ask the question. You don't point out that the people were wrong before. And you continue this perpetuation. And then you've got the situation where the media aren't critical of the fact that the President of the United States assigns the people that caused the problem in the first place to advise them on how to get out of it and all these things. And it's this flow. And you can watch it happen. And it basically comes down to ideology and sourcing, just like Allison said. But that's a real, ex real world example of how this sort of sourcing addiction to stay in on the big name economists um, and now because, because of this trend, there's a couple of, of American economists and, and one or two British economists that I can think of who have been critical all along, who are saying very critical things, who are still, I point out, within the mainstream. They're still mainstream pro-capitalist economists who are getting more attention now because they were right. Um, and they've, but, but it's almost, again, it's, it's almost uh, you know, reluctantly that the media is turning to them and saying, oh, OK, well, you seem to have some insight before, so now we'll ask you. But it still stays within the rubric of these aren't people who are going to question capitalism fundamentally. And the ones who really do, um, cap who, who really are critical of capitalism, are still pro-capitalism because even they, the ones, so uh, Nouriel Roubini, who's uh, an economist who's really big in the US, and I, I know that he's been published in some British outlets that I've read. Um, he says capitalism is, is rotten from the, to the core, that Marx was right. All this stuff, it's kind of crazy what he's saying lately. And then at the end he goes, eh, but we have no choice, so we have to keep going with it. So that's, he's the outlier. He is the absolute outlier of who's going to be heard. And, uh, and even progressive economists who I really like, like uh, Dean Baker in the US, um, these are people who don't really fundamentally question capitalism or point people to an alternative ever, ever, ever. Yeah, I think you're right. And it is about ideology like, and understanding what, how this can come about. That, like a Marx quote that I always find really useful is that the dominant ideas in society, the ideas of the ruling class, and that's what gets put out there. Um, one of the things... The ruling class to make money. Sorry, sorry. 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 But, but taking your model, it seems that basically anything that's a threat to the corporation in terms of what it wants to do, which is to either sell products or make money, they will do some sort of strategy to make sure it comes back online. So whether you're on the right or the left, if the left were able, you know, if the left had the sorts of fantasies and, and desires as the right to buy products, they couldn't care less which side of the yeah. spectrum you're on, surely. If it was selling, if it was getting out there, they wouldn't care. But it just seems to be that the reality is the right tend to like to go and buy things and live the Dallas life or whatever it is than the left because they have a more interesting people and, you know, sort of shared, shared wealth. So I wonder whether we're being deflected by the political agenda when, in essence, the corporations really just want you to buy their products and sell and make money. And so, again, you're talking about this divide and conquer attitude, my enemy means enemies, my friend. You talked about the, um, the example there, um, sorry, what was it, the priest? Um, yeah. the Polish priest as opposed to the 100 Latin Americans one. I mean, clearly they use Poland because, as you say, it's a, a, a Soviet country and therefore my enemy is enemy to my friend. I can expose my enemy for how bad they are because they've killed a, a Polish religious. Yeah. And, and in so doing, we then sympathize with the Polish victim. We then think how bad communism is. And then, of course, we bring down communism. That means open up free markets. We can put McDonald's in Moscow. Etc. Etc. Et so, are we being a little bit deflected by the political goings on when really it's just about the corporations making money? The I think some of them have got values just as you have. Well, I, I have. I, I, I'd like to respond to that because I, I love that question. It's one of my favorite ways to, to look at this. Um, would I'm going to boil it down differently and tell me if I'm getting you wrong? Would the media, if if leftist or anti-capitalist perspectives became all the rage, and 80% of people wanted to consume leftist ideas as, as media, would they make that shift? Um, there would be, that would be an incentive to make the shift, clearly, right? Sell more newspapers, give the people what they want, that idea earlier that we were talking about, that that is a major driver. But there are still a few filters at work. Um, it, well, actually, all the filters are still at work. So we've still got the ownership factor of what if, the, what if that means reporting on the idea that uh, private ownership of media is insane, which it is. And 
I don't know I'm whether I'm right or wrong about that, but I can make a really good case, and if anyone in the corporate media ever wanted to interview me, I think I could be fairly articulate about it, and I'd have a worthy opinion to at least hear whether I'm right or wrong. You won't hear that. Um, you know, should they be advertising driven? Same thing, I can make an outstanding case that they shouldn't. You simply won't hear it. And it's, it becomes this challenge of, of when do you, you know, where, where's that line? Where would they, when would they be willing to cross it? Because when would it start to risk and threaten and cost them more? So I have a, I have a curious example. Um, in 2003 when we were organizing, uh, we were doing initial fundraising to start the new standard, the project that we were working on. And I received a very funny uh, CC email Noam Chomsky to an extremely wealthy multi-billionaire American named Sheldon Drobny who out of his, literally out of his own pocket, well, literally out of his bank account, um, with his own money, not a loan or anything, funded Air America, the so-called leftist liberal radio network that was going to compete with all the right-wing talk radio. And Noam said, oh, talk to, he, he had asked Noam a bunch of questions and he said, talk to Brian Dominic, he, he knows about media and stuff. So all of a sudden I'm on the phone with a multi-billionaire who's looking to fund his own project out of his own pocket um, and knows a million of these Hollywood you know, liberals and he's got all this money. So I'm on the phone with him and I explain our project, but, but mostly he wants to talk about his project because he's a really rich guy and, and that's what he does. He talks about himself and his own ideas. He he, I mean, the man didn't listen to anything. But at one point I asked him, I said, well, I don't understand. You're going to be advertising driven, which is really how radio has to be done if it's not the community model. It's the only alternative to that that we understand uh, in, in the U.S. Um, and I said, if you're going to have this commercially driven thing, how are you going to have, you know, like teach people to think critically, encourage people to think critically about commercialism, about capitalism? And he said, I'll never forget his response. He said, oh, heavens no, it's nothing so esoteric. <laughs> Which I don't even know what he meant, but I mean, esoteric is like, you know, in other words, like we're not going to make you think. You know, and that's what he really was saying, I think. And I just was kind of floored. And, I, and he said, look, what we're trying to do is sell liberalism to people. So what we won't do is question systems, and I mean, he didn't go into all these details, I'm ad-libbing what I know was in his mind and I'll just, just have to trust me, I felt very strongly this is what he was saying, but you know, he basically was saying, we're not going to do that, we're not going to undermine anything. I mean, the man was a venture capitalist and I think he had a hand in trust funds, so he's not going to challenge that system. He would even make the argument, if I challenge that system, my goodness, I might lose all the money with which I'm funding all this wonderful leftist media. So I think that there's a limit. Um, and and the, the farthest that they're willing to go is the liberal, you know, get a hold of those liberal values and put them out front and try to sell them that way. And so here you have The Guardian that I think has that, that moniker. Um, is it Channel 4? Do they have kind of an yeah, identity yeah. like that? And in the U.S. we have MSNBC, like liberal, but not, not outside that sphere. But again, it relies on advertising. I suspect as yeah. part of its means of it, So it's just this thing that, you know, doesn't have to be on the left. You know, we look at what's happening in the finance market and we think money is evil, when in essence it isn't. It's the application and the use of money that's bad. And I'm wondering whether on the left-leaning thinking side of things that, that they've taken the position that, well, we can't have this because it represents the old system whereby perhaps we should use the existing systems as they are but to change it. For example, companies, maybe they should become more cooperative, that you know, everyone has a vested interest from the, from the director down to the shop floor manager, but yet still use the same systems we have here, which have only been focused in the very few, as you say, a few oligarchs. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, we've got ourselves entrenched in this left-right political, you know, positioning and stuff, when in fact, perhaps we need to look at how we just do things now, the wealth distribution, you know, really, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And perhaps your filters is, is showing us that, but maybe we're too transfixed with the political sorts of agenda of, Sitting on the right and sitting on the left. That's, that's one. Uh, we're out of time, so that. Very good. It's got me thinking of. I, I think that's a great question to leave with. Uh, yeah. That's one of the many things that we need to think about when it when it comes to getting the big picture of the media. Do you want to add anything? No, no. Um, I agree. I okay. So thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. We tomorrow, Allison and I, in the first slot, are going to give. Uh, the applied version of this. We're going to talk about actually doing media analysis. We're going to look at real world examples and we're even going to do real time analysis of stuff that's in the news tomorrow morning. So I don't even know what we're going to be talking about. But we're going to bring in some newspapers and we're going to, again, it's going to be really participatory. We're going to have you guys involved. Um, so if you enjoyed this, please uh, come back and, and tell your friends to come to tomorrow's session. First slot in the morning, whatever time that is.
And I also have another, I have a weird announcement, which is that I don't leave the UK, or I, I, I have a flight out of Heathrow on the 20th, and I'm really interested in checking out people's projects. I don't have a lot of plans between now and then. So if you're doing something interesting, including what you're doing, uh, I do media consulting, but I'm not, this is, I'm not advertising, I'm not charging. I'd love to come and crash on a couch somewhere, or maybe, and check out what you guys do, and I really want to learn about projects that are going on in the UK or on the continent. Um, I'm pretty much free to roam, so if anybody wants to bring me home, <laughs> <laughs> and I can pay my own way. <laughs>